Well, they're the only major people group in the world without their own country. And now those folks known as Kurds are facing a vicious assault from the terrorists of ISIS. Is the United States doing enough to help them? Gary Lane has a look at the crisis facing the Kurds and a bit of the peek at the history of these remarkable people. The ancient people known as the Kurds are scattered throughout the Middle East. They've suffered extreme persecution over the centuries, including a poison gas attack launched against them by Saddam Hussein in March 1988. 12,000 Kurds died an agonizing death. They now control this region in northeastern Syria, and Iraqi Kurdistan has welcomed Christians fleeing ISIS atrocities. Kurds long for a country they can call their own. This is a dream of every Kurdish citizens. Every ethnic and every nationality have a right to have their own independent states. A referendum on independence could soon be voted on by Iraqi Kurds, but Iran and Turkey oppose the creation of a Kurdish country. The Kurdish Workers' Party has fought Turkey for the past 30 years. Turkey views the Kurds as a greater threat than the Islamic State jihadists. Instead of fighting ISIS, the Turkish Air Force recently bombed Kurdish fighters near the border. The Turks uh, are acting with the slogan, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So ISIS is now, in that case, a friend of Turkey. And that further complicates U.S. efforts to stop ISIS. In the book, The Miracle of the Kurds, best-selling author Stephen Mansfield explains why the Kurds need Western support and how a Kurdish nation could serve as a model for the future of the Middle East. Well, Stephen Mansfield is joining us now to talk about his book. It's called The Miracle of the Kurds. Stephen, good to have you with us. Great Thanks to be with you. Here. Thank you. You have a love affair with these people. It just <laughs> screams forth from this book. I, I love this thing that they wanted to go to a town where they, they had achy, breaky hearts. <laughs> Tell them about that. Oh, there's a story told about how the Kurds first got to Nashville. And it is that a, chief, a Kurdish chieftain heard the song Achy, Breaky Heart playing on American radio and, and uh, saw his grandchildren dancing. And so what he, he told the American government, I want to go where that music lives. But mm -hmm. it's probably not true, but it's a good story well, it's anyway. It's a wonderful story. <laughs> uh, all right, the origin, you pointed out, you know, Saladin, as you pointed out, uh, the, who was so active in the Crusades, a great leader, was a Kurd. And also, I believe you said that uh, Cyrus uh, was a Kurd, and the Kurds take their origin from the Medes, the Medes and the Persians. Tell us about that. Well, the Kurds absolutely see themselves as the descendants of the ancient Medes we know from our Bibles. Mm -hmm. uh, so their television station in Europe is Mede TV. Their, uh, their national anthem declares, we are the Medes. So they see themselves in those terms. What's important for us to know is that they're not Arabs. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't come from that ethnicity, they don't come from that background, and yet since World War I, they've always been subdivided in a way that made them a minority people within well, Arab countries. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, and again, you pointed out in your excellent book that uh, he said that all people groups should have autonomy, and the Kurds, of course, were that group among the groups. What did they do? Were they fighting among themselves that's kind of turned the Western powers off? They, they, they descended into religious civil war just around the time of, the, of, of World War I. So uh, even though Woodrow Wilson was talking about autonomy for them specifically, uh, European powers bartered those powers and those rights away in the Treaty of Lausanne. Um, and so the Kurds ended up being bundled into the newly minted country of Iraq. So they were made a minority people, not Arab, within a broader Arab country. And they were persecuted from that time uh, all the way up to the time of Saddam. Well, Saddam gassed them. It was hideous what he did to them. Uh, Saddam probably killed almost a million Kurds. He decimated almost 4,000 villages. And uh, as, as you well know, because you, you reported on it so beautifully here, um, Halabja, uh, was the great gassing experience in which almost 15,000 people were killed in a matter of two hours. It was mm. horrific. Um, the only good thing about all of these atrocities against the Kurds is that has, it has finally brought them to international attention. And now that they're on the forefront against ISIS, um, the Kurds are, are being understood a little bit better. Your book is a miracle, the Kurds, and you're talking about Erbil. I mean, here the Iraq is in shambles, torn all to 
pieces. And they put in laws in the Kurdish stand that, that are so enlightened. Where did they learn about the, the, the freedom as they put into place? Well, the Kurds are people who love knowledge. Their leaders are educated in the West to a, to a large extent. And so, for example, I think what you're alluding to, and, and I love it as well, the 2006 Economic Investment Law yeah. essentially welcomed Western investment on an astonishingly open and free market basis. I would use the word libertarian. Um, if you were to invest, in Kurdistan, you'd have equal rights as a citizen of Kurdistan. There would be tax breaks. In other words, they knew they weren't going to become viable as a nation, which is what they hoped for, unless they welcomed foreign investment. Well, the money poured. I mean, they gave tax holiday, 10-year tax holidays oh, yeah. and stuff, and money just poured in, and suddenly these, these shopping centers burst forth and office buildings. It's extraordinary. Well, even right now, while the Kurds of Peshmerga are fighting ISIS out on the battlefield, if we went through... Uh, Erbil right now, you'd see six-star, five-star hotels, you'd see beautiful parks, hospitals, restaurants, uh, housing developments. Uh, what they've accomplished is since the advent of the no-fly zone and with their mm -hmm. economic law is absolutely astonishing. How did they learn that? Well, they, first of all, it comes down through their heritage. Uh, the, the laws of the Medes and the Persians that we hear mm -hmm. and read about in the Bible uh, encourages private property. Uh, respect for law, that's, that's the foundation of their heritage. Then, of course, they simply read economists. If you talk to their leaders, they've read uh, Milton Friedman. They've read some of the, some of the Austrian economists. They, they've watched the economic experiment, mm -hmm. experiments around the world. So when they had a chance to uh, uh, determine their own affairs, they didn't go socialist. They didn't go Baathist. Uh, they went free market. They went openness and freedom and libertarian, and it's, and it's paying for itself. It's proving itself. Well, they've got the oil fields of Kirkuk, and there was a, uh, they tried to ex Export some of the. Are they getting the oil out now? Or are they? Are, it was still claimed by the nation of Iraq as part of Iraq's money rather than the Kurds' money. Sure. Every time there's some kind of an embargo uh, with Iraq, as there has been through the years, it's a double embargo against the Kurds because Iraq is not, I mean, I'm sorry, Baghdad uh, is not very supportive of the Kurds. They don't pass Western aid onto the Kurds. So the Kurds have had to go it alone. And that may be one of the few really wonderful things about what's happening now is that since the Kurds are on the forefront against yeah. ISIS, the West is having to realize we can't run our supplies and our support through the corrupt and divided Baghdad. We'll have to supply the Kurds directly, and finally the U.S. is getting that message. Well, one of the, the leader of Iraq just said, I don't want any foreign troops in my country, and that included the U.S. I mean, he, he's anti-America. Yes, there's no question. But the, uh, yeah, go ahead. We, we, we just tend to choose our, the wrong friends in the Middle East. Oh, All right. <laughs> we well, should. Let's talk about Kurdistan. There's a huge population of Kurds in Syria, big population in Turkey, and a very big population in Iraq. Right now, Kurdistan is that little enclave around Erbil, uh, which is under siege. When are the major powers, do you think, ever going to come together and say, okay, they ought to have their own country and bring them all together? It, it, there probably is not going to be a consensus anytime soon, but the U.S. ought to take the lead here. Mm -hmm. uh, the Kurds are, uh, surprise us because they are pro-Western, pro-democracy, mm -hmm. largely pro-Israel. Uh, their version of Islam, even though they're 97% Muslim, uh, is moderate. They have women on the Supreme Court. There's a Christian mm. department within yeah. their government. Uh, it's astonishing. And so I think the U.S., if the U.S. will take the lead, support them directly, and call for nationhood, I think we'll see it happen much faster. Stephen, I, I, in my heart, there is no question, Iraq is a failed state. It, yes. it is put together after World War I. It, it, it is an arbitrary uh, assembly by the European powers. And these people deserve their own country. There's no question. But the thing is, you, it's so interesting, you love being there. They, they killed you with kindness. I, I, I've never seen such hospitable people. They are welcoming. They have a sense of covenant. A lot of what we read, read in Scripture about the way a meal was a covenantal experience. This is how the Kurds live. Uh, they bring gifts. They, they are I wish every American could spend some time in Kurdistan when this ISIS crisis is over. Uh, they'll be amazed by these people. Well, they really, they just overwhelmed you with kindness. They did. They did. They, they, when, when gunfire happened at one point, they threw their bodies on me to protect me. They welcomed me in their homes. Uh, they're constantly inviting you to some uh, to a wedding or a new feast. It would be an honor for us, they say all the time. Um, you, you just become endeared to them, and I certainly did.
Well, this book is a is, is more of a love story than it, <laughs> than it is a novel. But it's I'm good. I'm proud of that. <laughs> it's good reading. It's called The Miracle of the Kurds. And I tell you, in my heart, I know it's the answer to the mess that's there in Iraq and Iran. And if the United States took its head out of the sand, they'd say, let's get those people together for their own country as fast as we can and give them all the help we can. And, and we'd have a strong ally in the Middle East, a lot stronger than the new Iraq and certainly a lot stronger than Turkey or Iran and Syria. No question about it. And I want to say to you, too, that they really respect you for having stood with them through the years. The Kurds don't have a lot of friends, yeah. but they know they have one in Pat Robertson, and I'm, I'm, well, I personally appreciate that as well. Without question, just something in my heart that just goes up to them. They're just wonderful people. And I hope that that oil stuff succeeds. They've got a big field in Kirkuk. Yes. Uh, whatever happened to that refinery, did the ISIS took it over. Did they get it? Did the Kurds get it back? The Kurds took it back. They took it back? They took it back. Mm -hmm. Well. God bless them. Yeah, they're, good. They're, they're fierce warriors, very skilled, very gifted. All we need to do is support them. Stephen, thank you for your work and appreciate this book. It's very interesting.